Hi. Um, hi. Hi. Hi, Rome. <laughs> I, I will introduce you, but it takes a while until it gets. Uh, uh, okay, all right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> just oh my God. like, okay, I'm excited to talk now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think now we're live, right? Um, so, hi, everyone. Welcome to Instituto, to our WIP Work in Progress series. This is the last session curated by Bruno Alves da Almeida, and today we uh, will watch a presentation by the collective Metacito in conversation with Bruno Alves da Almeida. Uh, please feel free to leave your questions and comments in our YouTube chat and find more information about this series and today's guests in the description below. Um, Bruno will tell us uh, about today's guests. Uh, Bruno, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yes, the last session of four, um, discursive events that Institute to, invited me to curate and it's really a great pleasure to be here with Liva Dudareva and Eduardo Cassina who have co-founded Metacito uh, in 2014 and uh, explore since then the way we relate to territory across time and disciplines for a queerer tomorrow. Um, Metacito's practice is centered around non-hierarchical symbiotic pedagogies that take the form of urbanism residencies, architectural interventions, intentional communities, self-publishing, real estate experiments, and videos. Oof, quite a lot, guys. Their work has largely focused on shrinking cities in Eastern Ukraine and the Russian Far East, and more recently, they have been researching vacancy and reunification processes in Dubai's office towers. Currently, they both teach at uh, INDA in Bangkok, and before, I give the word to Eduardo and Liva. I would like to reiterate um, that those of you watching on YouTube, please leave your comments and questions in the chat and we'll uh, address them later in our conversation. So Eduardo, Liva, good to see you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And the floor is yours. Thank you. So much. Thank you. We're very happy to be here. Thank you so much there. Bruno for our invitation. Very excited to share some of our work and I have a conversation about it. So yeah, uh, I'm Liva and... And I am Eduardo. And uh, as Bruno said, we are forming the collective Metacito. I'll try to share uh, my screen um, and start our presentation. Okay, so... Um, as Bruno already mentioned, uh, Metacito began in 2014 in Moscow. That's uh, where we both uh, met. Our backgrounds uh, are in architecture and uh, this uh, collaboration grew out of our interests uh, to expand the discourse of uh, architecture and urbanism beyond uh, the confine of, uh, of the architectural practice. And uh, one of the goals or aims of Metacito has been to empower individuals in a way they relate uh, to territory. So we're very much interested to think about different tools of how could it be done and how can we um, establish these uh, communities. So um, we've been a nomadic practice uh, for most uh, of uh, the Metacito uh, being. And um, the kind of moving from the architecture into the art uh, world really allowed us uh, and provided us with certain infrastructure uh, to pursue this uh, interest uh, in a more unorthodox way uh, that would not perhaps been possible at the time in academia or architectural practice. Um, in particular, the artistic residences that allowed us to develop quite a rich uh, body of work. And also what's probably even more important, um, this infrastructure allowed us to reach um, audiences that were very diverse uh, and uh, different. Um, so one of the key concepts uh, in the very beginning uh, of uh, our um, And uh, ecumenopolis uh, is a term from Greek that literally means that the whole world is urban. 
it was not coined by us, but it was coined by Konstantinos Doxiadis, uh, who is uh, an extremely interesting figure in the post-war uh, urban planning. Um, and uh, it literally means that the whole world is uh, urban. Um, if we think uh, about uh, today's, I mean, so Doxiadis basically thought that, uh, he was projecting that uh, with the growth of population and uh, a kind of structures and infrastructures that are needed to connect these populations, the world will be truly urban. And of course, if we think today about uh, this, um, <clears throat> about more than half of the whole world's population living in cities, um, his uh, projection has really come true. And also, of course, with uh, the arrival of uh, internet that he didn't uh, witness. Um, so uh, we started to look at these typologies that we thought are really urban um, and kind of repeating throughout uh, the world. So, for example, um, airports or the free economic zone or metro station. So a kind of uh, spatial um, evidence, let's say, of a humanopolis. Um, that we all know how to navigate because this is uh, our default uh, habitat uh, right now. Um, this led us uh, to a body of work that consists of several uh, short uh, video pieces where through our own uh, experience and observations, we looked for these particular spaces and kind of materialized uh, in, uh, in a show at uh, Transit in Budapest dedicated to the ecumenopolis, the whole world as one city, where we created this very immersive uh, environment with space blankets. It was also a period we really loved to work with uh, this material. We covered also our own home uh, in them, where uh, the audience were able to follow some of those uh, journeys and uh, ideas. Also, we will share uh, a little bit later in detail uh, some of this work that was presented that relates uh, to extractivism. So what's really important about this period of ecumenopolis uh, for us as Meta C2 is the, that it allowed us um, to create our own discourse on contemporary urbanism, um, which is rooted in our own observations and experiences. Uh, you could call it perhaps a kind of urban out of theory. Uh, following from Ecumenopolis uh, in 2015, we were invited for another artist residency in Ukraine. And um, this marks another very important chapter uh, for uh, Meta Situ, which is uh, the Degros Institute. And it began in this uh, Eastern Ukrainian town that is uh, on the border uh, with the occupied, now occupied territories called Mariupol. And it's a very interesting town. It used to be the, one of the largest steel producers in whole Soviet Union. And uh, since the collapse of Soviet Union, its population has been shrinking a lot. So we went uh, to the office of the master planner and uh, we were curious, how does she envision the future of the city? And uh, she said that she sees a busy harbor. Uh, it slice on the coast of Azov Sea. Um, there will be a lot of skyscrapers and we joked that uh, it's gonna be like Hong Kong. And she said, yes, like Hong Kong. And the, um, as an architect, we are familiar with the idea of growth and desire for uh, building and uh, growing and expanding. But when confronted with this reality where actually uh, the city is uh, shrinking inevitably, uh, we felt there is a need to rethink the idea of growth and perhaps think about uh, alternative future. So one of the our first response uh, was to work uh, with the video work of uh, thinking how this growth uh, could be reverted. Um, we understood that it has to be a collective process because when you build, let's say on Tabula Rasa, it's much easier to create this new environment uh, with uh, little consideration for context. Of course, we see these sort of developments uh, around us. 
but it's much more difficult to think about uh, erasure when it touches a, a collective body of uh, inhabitants, when you see a certain places in the city becoming ruins. So we really thought what kind of tools could be there that allow for um, this more collective approach uh, in thinking about the futures that that doesn't involve growth. Um, I think also perhaps just a little remark uh, about uh, the degrowth. Degrowth is uh, becoming, it's, an, it's a term that's been uh, talked about, but often in the context, uh, in today's context, it's talking about um, places where there is abundance and then you're thinking about reducing. Whereas here is the context is very different. It is reducing, it want it or not. And actually, these places usually don't want to be reducing, but it is a, a kind of future that they're facing. And it's not only Eastern Ukraine, it's uh, many post-Soviet territories and uh, Europe as well as US. So we wrote uh, this uh, book, it's called the Degros uh, Manual, and uh, it is uh, partly artist book, but partly it is also a, a workbook um, it's written in a way where people can gather and go through it through different chapters, including cartography, um, memory, uh, and future, and think together from both individual, shared, and collective perspective of how we can how we can envision this degrowth. Some of the tools uh, include um, the cards that are telling the future of uh, shrinking. And these kind of tools, when we work with communities, allow uh, for us and for them to think a bit in the different trajectory. And so we've been uh, around in the, more in the post-Soviet space, I would say, um, in, uh, in Eastern Ukraine, but also in Far East Russia where we have been working in several uh, towns that has shared this common history of very industrialized uh, spaces, where city often grows around this industry. And now through the decline of the industry, they, they have to deal with certain identity crisis. So uh, we kind of spend time together for a day or two in order to rethink these kind of vectors uh, of uh, growth. One of the ideas of the degrowth manual is that it also allows us to archive these stories uh, because the generations are changing. And of course, also this information is slowly perhaps uh, disappearing. So with the degrowth manual, it's something uh, that we allow people can take uh, the books um, and uh, work with them, and then we exchange them for the new books. And one of the times uh, we had the opportunity to present uh, some of these materials that we collected was in Kiev, uh, in, uh, at the National Museum, where we talked about the degrowth. And what's interesting in this context is that as we talked about the degrowth, in the Meta Situ, we had to talk about the growth as we had to sort of find a ways to institutionalize us, in or not only in order to access uh, funding to work with the communities, uh, but also to validate ourselves in the eyes uh, of uh, collaborators. And of course, uh, it uh, allowed us uh, to think also differently about, uh, about the degrowth uh, from many different uh, perspectives. And when we think about uh, degrowth in this context, it's not only uh, the shrinking uh, cities, it also sort of start, we started to see the relevance of the topic in many other contexts, uh, such as Dubai, that we perhaps associate more with uh, a growth. Although it has one of the largest uh, vacancy in office spaces and um, in another artistic residency uh, invited by Alcertal Foundation, uh, we went on uh, visiting these uh, office spaces from kind of abandoned petrochemical uh, offices 
to um, aspiring fitness magazine to shell and core units as we are ascending to the top of the tower, which basically are the kind of unfitted units used for often for financial speculations and also discovering a lot of um, marks left by people who, who created the, these buildings. So we really uh, felt uh, a need to, to kind of have a discussion around the, the idea of these ruins in the city of Dubai. So for that purpose, uh, we organized a performative, semi-fictional, um, uh, semi-realistic um, uh, walks through the tower, where we also had an installation uh, that uh, inspired by the drawings, and a kind of like the real estate uh, realities um, culminated in a small office uh, pizza dinner where we would discuss then the issues surrounding the vacancy, ruinification and the possibilities of degrowth. And just to kind of wrap up about the degrowth, I think the most important thing here is that the degrowth does not necessarily for us mean uh, anti-growth, but it's imagining a very different vector that would use very different approaches that we are used to when we think about expansion. And I think this type of extractivism, um, so it, it's something that we noticed as we were preparing for this talk, um, that could be another kind of um, geometry or alignment for some of our works. So whereas, in our narrative, we always talk about okay, monopolies and then the Degrowth Institute and all our practice is kind of falls within these two umbrellas. Um, as we were kind of revisiting our works for this talk, we decided to create two other parallel lines, one being extractivism and another one being bonding between people. So for today, we will talk in more detail about these two lines. Um, the first one in extractivism, um, we begin in, in the West Bank. So we did this project, Tora Bora, uh, in 2015. And this project is about uh, Jerusalem stone. Jerusalem stone is a type of limestone uh, that can be found in the Levant of, of the Mediterranean. Uh, since Ottoman times, uh, Jerusalem stone has been legislated into the construction of cities in the sense that uh, and this was a, a law that was kind of or adapted or incorporated by the, under the British mandate and that is still like kind of um, relevant or active in today's uh, both Israel and uh, Palestine, where uh, all houses or buildings in the West Bank and into have a facade cladding of uh, at least 70% coverage of, of limestone. Now, the thing is that this type of, of limestone uh, is of course extremely fetishized. Uh, not only like it's, there is a great demand for it because there is a lot of construction taking place both in the West Bank as well as Israel, but also is fetishized because of its origin. It's fetishized because it's coming from the Holy Land and new synagogues in, in Germany are being built with this stone. Uh, new churches in Latin America, as we'll see later, are being built with this stone. And, and palaces in, in the Gulf are being built with this stone. Um, now, the quarries for this stone are largely unregulated, or at least they were in 2015, um, unregulated and in the West Bank. Now, as you know, the West Bank, uh, due to the Oslo Accords, is separated into four larger areas, area A, B, and C, and D, or natural parks slash military. And um, the Palestinian Authority only has legislative powers in areas A and B. Now, uh, here you can see in, in light brown areas A and B, and in darker areas C and natural park. Now, a lot of the quarries, uh, would fall under area C, just because area C occupies most of the land. Um, but this would have um, an impact, perhaps not necessarily an impact. This is one of the quarries uh, that we were, the quarry of Beit Fajar, where we were working with uh, quite actively, but also in terms of like the type of activities that were happening. 
So in area B under Palestinian jurisdiction, the quarrying will be taking place during the day, whereas in area C, uh, it would be taking place at night because it was under Israeli um, occupational mandate, but also, um, um, so at the same time, there is a lot of demand for this stone. So the, it's a bit of a game of, of like a, a mouse and a cat, right? Where, where there is a lot of demands, but so they let them do their, their activity, but at the same time, every now and then there would be raids where uh, machine equipment and equipment would be confiscated. So quarrying at night uh, was an alternative they found. Uh, additionally, of course, the quarrying due to the political situation cannot uh, happen with any um, explosives. So it's a very, very mechanical process. So we spent several nights in these quarries um, with these people that were extracting the stone at night in this extremely precarious, but also incredibly bizarre conditions. I mean, these very anthropocenic landscapes already are pretty unique and under the flat light, they perhaps uh, looked even more uh, surreal. Um, as you can see, the, the landscape, the way it is transformed is extremely radical. During our time there, the, the ministry invited us in Ramallah to talk about the national plan for um, the re regulation of these quarries. And it was a very heated meeting where there were quarry owners um, kind of very protective of the kind of status quo or deregulation and non-regulation that existed at the time, as well as like mayors of towns that had to live next to these stone crushers or, or other facilities that produced a lot of smoke and, 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 and dust, um, extremely unhealthy. And in our journey, as we were going from quarry to quarry and visiting all these factories and meeting all these different people, we uh, heard stories of entire mountains disappearing, uh, mostly for export. And we heard of the largest export that had taken place, which was an export to Brazil, the largest single export from uh, the West Bank. And we tracked down the, the quarry, is this quarry that you can see up here. And uh, basically we were wondering where that volume went. Um, we followed the, the track of, of that volume and that led us to Sao Paulo, where we visited um, the Igreja Universal, is a Pentecostal church in Brazil run by uh, Bishop Macebo, a very in influential uh, political figure. And um, this, he built the third temple of Solomon following a biblical descriptions of the temple of Solomon and bringing materials from the Holy Land. The temple in itself actually featuring Yael Bartana's video Inferno um, and is located in a neighborhood called Brass, a um, very humble neighborhood in Sao Paulo. Um, what was interesting was that also in that process of construction, uh, the Igreja Universal was able to import the rock uh, without paying taxes, claiming that it was a holy um, element, holy material, rather than construction material, which would be taxable, whereas religious objects would not. And um, it's, it, and of course, the Supreme Court in Brazil got involved, uh, claiming that it was a construction material, um, but the church replied that it was um, holy, holy stones. Um, and I think in here it was um, being, for us it was very interesting to see how the invisible hand of, um, of the market of extractivism is not only about extracting uh, the resources uh, in the occupied West Bank the, or, or extracting whole mountains by the quarry owners, the Palestinian quarry owners, uh, but it's also in a way extracting ideologies and extracting or, or stealing from taxes or evading tax taxation um, in places as far as Brazil, just usurpating that, that narrative um, of holiness. And I think uh, seeing that kind of uh, 
scale of extraction that goes into creating a, a building. It's also very interesting for us uh, to think about the demolishing uh, the building and uh, we're traveling back to Dubai to Al Sarkal Avenue where we were invited to think about the extractive urbanism and also the process of uh, demolishing within the territory of uh, Al Sarkal in Dubai uh, where the director of the foundation invited us uh, to return the building to how it was before. So that led us thinking to what kind of time frame, uh, what we are thinking. Here you can see this is uh, Nadi, that's uh, our site for potential demolishing. That it used to be a, a marble cutting facility before Al Sertal uh, moved in there, which is now kind of vibrant gallery uh, creative district. Uh, it had, has several roles from a kind of uh, co-working space uh, and the uh, cafe um, to uh, a space, a shell that contains uh, different public uh, commissions and uh, to a potential return in some period uh, of time. So thinking about that, uh, we were of course thinking how as architects, uh, we are taught how to build, but we are not really taught of how to take things apart. Um, and so we were thinking about moments in history where people thought about potential reunification. I think architects are a bit sensitive perhaps uh, on uh, their creation becoming a ruin, but there is a, an example uh, by John Sons uh, for uh, making the design for Bank of England, where his assistant, um, uh, Michael Gandhi, not only created this visualization for how the Bank of England is going to look like, but also of how it potentially looked like as a ruin. And of course, there are precedents of thinking about uh, thinking of ruin as a kind of um, architectural typology, and this is uh, folly, um, a kind of like uh, constructed ruins or uh, exotic pavilions uh, emerging in uh, 18th uh, century. Also, what is very interesting with the folly, we all understand that it's this extravagant uh, pavilion built with no uh, utilitarian uh, purpose, but they also were used in certain periods of history as a way to support the uh, craftsmen and artisans uh, for them not to lose the dignity, but uh, to keep uh, producing the work. So thinking about uh, the ruin in this context and what would that mean in the context uh, of uh, Dubai and UAE, um, we did some site visits uh, to Al Madam, which is a buried village uh, in uh, in Sharjah Emirate, and uh, also we went to the site uh, that used to be a Universal Studios. But when we went, it was has already disappeared. So in Dubai, um, the ruins disappear quite quickly. They're demolished, uh, and something new comes up. So we really wanted to bring that discourse. Uh, in and uh, we began uh, by starting a kind of uh, curious excavation uh, within uh, the Nadi, which would allow us uh, to return it to a certain period of time. Uh, in this case, uh, we accidentally discovered uh, some remains from the from the marble cutting facilities and pieces uh, of uh, marble. We also filled the, the whole room uh, with uh, the sand to bring back some of the presence of the desert uh, in the city as it has kind of been uh, exiled out of the urban fabric uh, of Dubai. But then we were thinking about larger timelines that we also wanted to represent in this work, which were the wetlands when we think about the last ice age of uh, 10,000 years ago and the lush wetlands that used to be uh, in this uh, location. So 
in this work, it was very important for us to incorporate uh, the, the idea of ruin in architectural discourse. And we would like to take you on a small tour now through, through the work. So it was a very immer immersive experience where you really enter and can, ex can read either the timelines we propose or uh, read your own timelines uh, there as well uh, and uh, walk in across all the spaces, um, excavation, the sand room, the wetlands, um, and create really your own choreography around uh, the work. Um, and I think it's very important when we talk about the ruins, it's not, uh, it's also important to understand the complexity of, uh, of this uh, discourse, because not only a ruin is something uh, that, you know, we can trace and see as the timeline uh, of something that has happened before, but there's also, of course, certain fetish uh, around the ruins in today's uh, urban uh, fabric. So we felt it's important to explore all these different facets of it. I think also um, another matter or another subject, as I was mentioning earlier, that came up when we were putting together this presentation was the idea of bonding uh, and how present this has been in our um, in our own practice. I mean, as we were talking earlier, uh, the residency format or that type of infrastructure that the art world provides uh, was there from the very beginning, has been very present since the very beginning of, of Meta C2. And to the point that we also incorporated that into our practice and we even run our own residencies as part of the Degrowth Institute. We also run workshops, but we also run month long residencies. Um, and this kind of, this interest in the residency or the, the collectivization of, of a group of people is what led us to the next project, Foundation. So in 2018, we were approached by Sibylle Fecht to have a show about uh, our work on, on cities and urbanism. Uh, and we suggested to her to use the budget for the production of the show to make a new work uh, that would be somehow a type of residency. At the time, we were very interested in the idea of kinship and how bonds were formed. I think we were extensively talking about uh, the degrowth of city, master planning for degrowth. And, but one thing that really came apparent, not only in terms of cities, but also ourselves going into residencies was the power that it had a group of people being dropped into a new context and, and the bonds that they formed. So we wanted to, to research that further. They, and that's how Foundation came about. So we, uh, Foundation was a project where we would invite six people to live together, uh, six people that didn't know each other through an anonymous application process to live together in a gallery in, in, in Bonn, in Das Zimmer, for one week without leaving the space, without connecting to the outside world, with the intention of founding a new community or a new city. And uh, what would that process be? What would those rituals be? Uh, so we created this anonymous open call uh, where people just Google forms and we told people about the project and people could apply with a, a pseudonym. Um, afterwards, um, there was a selection committee and uh, four people, like well, the, the people were, were selected. And then um, we started foundation. And uh, we're just going to show the first two minutes of the video we made. As I said, we were uh, six participants plus uh, Sammy, who was a videographer, and he was the only person that would come in and out of the space uh, with us. Um, he would normally be filming between eight to 12 hours a day and with that footage. Um, produced it.
Um, I've really enjoyed it. The whole process for me was really interesting experience and I think I imagined it like it will be a little bit different. Um, I think it's, it's probably been quite different from what I expected um, and I'm not really sure <laughs> what we've done or achieved. But yeah, I mean definitely it was like Impre impressive. Maybe it's the role that not having internet or phones or we didn't watch any films or listen to music or look at the time, I think maybe that helped kind of cultivate quite a kind of um, quite a kind of mad energy amongst us. <laughs> Take four minutes, uh, minutes and tell your partner your life story in as much de <laughs> detail as possible. The collective story. We decide to cut us ourselves off, you mean the which is kind of nice, but it's also like super self-focused. Mm. So we arrived here. We arrived here on the 1st of February 2019. I arrived first. So I, I really feel it's an interesting experience. Well, um, yeah, so basically after this week of, of total isolation, uh, we had to make an exhibition that would open a week after the experiment was over. So that exhibition consisted of all the remains uh, of, of that week of, of bonding. Uh, a lot of the remains were costumes of, from a play we had, as well as several kind of um, structures that we built to inhabit the space, our homes. We also had a lamination machine, which became very, very crucial and a very important tool for, for us to, to play and to work. And um, um, these are some of the costumes from that play. And then um, these are some of the, well, the video was projected. And then these are some of the structures we built um, during our stay collectively. And uh, this idea of remoteness and like how people connect when they are remote uh, is not something that was necessarily new in Metacity, it's something that we had been in our minds for, for a long time. Uh, and I mean, this is our last project for today, but the, it would be TDCU 1ZZ, um, which is also a residency project. And it's also about a group of people isolated, or rather two groups of people that are isolated from the rest of the world. So this was, uh, it's a project about the island of Tristan da Cunha. Tristan da Cunha is an island in the South Atlantic. It's supposed to be the, the world's most remote inhabited uh, place. It's got a city or a village called Edinburgh of the Seven Seas with around 300 people. Uh, 300 people with seven family names. Uh, the island was uninhabited until the 1800s when the British sent uh, some sailors there to keep an eye in case the French tried to liberate, to free Napoleon from St. Helena. When Napoleon passed, these, fam these sailors decided to stay and then they were joined later on by two others. Now, this island is at the very tail end of the supply chain, the global supply chain. And this is something that really fascinated us, but it's also uh, on a volcano. So in 1962, uh, the volcano erupted and uh, all the inhabitants were evacuated back to England. Um, and after two years, they, they begged to go back to the island. Uh, although the, there was a very strong a wish for them to assimilate to British society at large, uh, this was not something that, that happened. Uh, but I think what interested us about that story was that in the early 2000s, the island governor wrote a letter to the House of Lord Lords in London for a colonial amendment so that they could change their postcode to a more UK sounding one. And the reason for this was to ease online shopping. Now, this is an island that is completely, uh, that doesn't have an airport or any way to, re to be reached by air, can only be reached by boat. And there are boats that go by nine times a year. So the idea of wanting um, a, po a more UK sounding postcode to ease on the shops, on the shopping for, for eBay or Amazon was something that to us um, sounded extremely 
exciting in terms of like how we advance that ecumenopolis discourse of uh, the whole world being urban and part of one global supply chain and the arrival of the internet so with that premise we went on an artist residency that was supposed to be part uh, on, on a boat that was supposed to depart from brazil and then sail all the way to tristan da cunha we were a total of seven artists i think seven or nine artists on board of this boat and uh, when we arrived, we realized that the residency organizer had not necessarily prepared for, for this journey properly, which also comes to tell a lot in terms of the vulnerability also of that art world infrastructure of residences that we're relying on. Um, but that aside, uh, we stayed for several weeks on, on this kind of limbo stays navigating up and down Brazilian waters, uh, going to different places. Our captain was an absolutely extravagant person who consulted every day his decisions on Nordic runes and made very weird decisions based on whatever the stones told him. And anyways, and at the end, we, we ended up um, not going. Uh, we, Liv and I made the decision to, to not uh, to jump out of the boat and the, the, everyone kind of followed suit immediately. And our video T, TDCU 1ZZ is at three, is the combination of three stories. So on the one hand, we have the story of, of Tristan da Cunha uh, narrated uh, by a fictional voice, by, but uh, with real characters um, of its history, particularly in the 20th century, from the evacuation of the volcano until the arrival of the internet. There was another layer that was more of a narrator's voice in terms of like what was happening in that residency space or the situation as it was evolving, as well as interwoven with our own personal video diary that we were just filming for ourselves uh, and we were not intending to make anything with it. Um, so yeah, that was the, the idea we had. And I think this it's interesting how it ties up a bit with our initial concept. I mean, we developed this within the umbrella of Ecumenopolis and, and understanding how the, the entire world is uh, one urban matrix. But I think, of course, this experience really made us reevaluate our real wishes and ambitions as to why we wanted to go to, to that um, island in the first place. Yeah, uh, I think it's a great project to finish as it uh, puts together all all the things we've been talking uh, about today from Ecumenopolis, uh, extraction, uh, the kind of inhabitation, but also how do you create a community and bond with other people. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo and Niva. That was beautiful. I love the way you guided, guided us through the content, both visually and discursively, was super smooth. <laughs> um, maybe we can start stop sharing the screen so you yes. your faces pop up larger in my screen. Um, I want to go back to the um, to the beginning, uh, to this notion of ecumenopolis, and also connected to uh, some of the things that we discussed on the previous sessions. Uh, around notions of site-specific, uh, o grupo inteiro on the second session uh, brought us notions of body specificity, person specificity, and knowledge specificity, which kind of, for them, is what makes sense in their work. In, in um, yeah, as an alternative to this idea, to this prevailing idea of site specificity, and then Mona and Asli uh, on the last session also brought us the idea of politics of location that was formulated by feminist poet uh, Adrian Risch and basically understands location as a place of experience connections and, and intersection, so not as a fixed entity. And Mona and Asli also mentioned this, this uh, sentence, uh, roots more than roots. So roots, uh, like trajectories, itineraries more than a fix fixity. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see a lot uh, of that in your work in some way. So I was interesting, uh, interested that 
this notion of ecumenopoly is by extending the notion of the city to the whole globe kind of emphasizes the interconnectedness of uh, global social practices and networks that kind of articulate and co-shape our existence. And, and, and as a consequence, it also provides us with a new sense of locality or a new sense of specificity. So I, I was curious to know how you deal with the, with the notion, if at all, of such sure. in your work. Um, versus the sense of locality that results from a complete global interconnectedness, both, yeah, tangibly and also immaterially. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this idea of, of the globality is something that is becoming more and more uh, present in our, even in our understanding. And I can even see how we are, we have changed so much in our own perception of ecumenopoly since we began working on it until today. But I think even at a, at a global scale, right? Things like climate change cannot be discussed with the understanding of a city and then a landfill that is located outside the jurisdiction of that city and, and that kind of belongs to another world. Uh, because I think if you think about it, Ecumenopolis is also a return to the walled city in a way that the atmosphere is our wall and uh, we are very much contained uh, mm -hmm. within that. Now, of course, dealing with that specificity was perhaps maybe the, the reaction that brought us to the Degrowth Institute afterwards. Because when we were talking about ecumenopolis, we were always looking at, at global phenomena. And in fact, especially that first year when we're traveling from residency to residency back to back, and we're extremely fortunate to see so many different spaces and analyzing and seeing how there were so many similarities between these spaces, I think with the Degrowth Institute, actually, we took the opposite direction, which was how we cannot apply universal mechanisms or universal methods mm -hmm. to degrowth. You cannot, uh, you have to be absolutely specific what a, a regular housing block is layered and is mothered with, with memories and, and concepts and ideas that are so specific to that particular built fabric. And uh, yeah, so I think, Exploring both poles was something that, yeah. I think also that you need to learn thinking into a hybrid because today nothing is completely local and nothing is completely global. Even when we look at these global uh, typologies, there might be uh, other layers uh, that are more local. So I think, uh, and when we think about locality and site specific, we also cannot discuss that ignoring larger issues. I think example that Eduardo mentioned that tackling global issues like climate change is uh, impossible only on a local uh, level. Yeah, and considering these ideas of nation state and, and um, yeah. um, abstract separations or le legislative, you know, for, yeah, fractures. Um, in our exchange of emails, you mentioned that you were going to talk a little bit about how you kind of inhabit your practice so that your work and research are also kind of embodied practices um, throughout your life or vice versa. Uh, and I think this idea of inhabiting the praxis, you take it really even further in projects such as Foundation or TDCU 1ZZ that you just showed us. Uh, also tapping into the genre of kind of a reality show. That's the vibe that one gets when watching those videos. And so maybe I wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit more how, how the, the, uh, this entanglement between practice and life or practice and work and research and your own methods of survival or living. Right, I think for us it's very important not to separate the two and the uh, meta situ has been uh, a kind of like a, a journey into how do you combine both, uh, both worlds. The same way when we talk about ecumenopolis as like everything uh, is urban and there is no rural and urban. So when we talk about the practice, there is no life outside the practice uh, or uh, the practice. I think partly it's also probably um, evolved because of the infrastructures, as we mentioned before, uh, we moved, uh, we work very interdisciplinary and we moved from a more architectural practice to an artistic uh, practice. 
And in that moon, we were able um, to use certain uh, spaces, access different audiences uh, that uh, also very much require actually the embodiment of the practice, uh, I would say. I think also what was very interesting for us was how, uh, for example, in foundation, as I was saying, this idea of establishing kinship through people that are not uh, sharing fluids. This means that they're not blood related, they're not lovers. So how do you, how do we build a relationship? Like what brings these two individuals together? So of course we have ideal, like we have infrastructure such as the nation state and the idea or, or like a culture or a shared language, shared references. Now Liv and I were, were not lovers or were not blood related and we were definitely exploring how do we um, ex like expand that territory of, of kinship between the two of us. Um, beyond that, we, we, we bought property together, we were living together, we were um, sh sharing finances. So uh, I think exploring this, these boundaries is something that uh, perhaps was the most interesting part of Meta City for us, although it's not the one that um, gets documented or, or the one that we, we showed on shows. But it was definitely very transformative. I think maybe also through this process of living your own uh, practice, when we we also kind of reflect in our, uh, our um, artworks and the kind of results that are there that we uh, personally really value. So in our practice, we really enjoy the immaterial, uh, either connections that happen between the people, uh, the the small empowerment or larger empowerment that uh, can happen through a workshop uh, or encounter. Uh, so I think this uh, also kind of um, probably is a result of uh, constantly, you know, we're not documenting necessarily everything uh, into our practice, but uh, even those things are really essential and probably are reflected in the work that is being done then. When uh, seeing foundation is really, I was thinking a lot about this fluctuation between, you know, the real group dynamics, because we indeed see people in a process of bonding and getting to know each other and having, and not, you know, uh, role playing, but we also see kind of moments of reenactment, moments that are more performative. So I'm interested in this blurring between daily life and performativity, also as a strategy for um, uh, creating new types of knowledge exchange. How do you calibrate that balance uh, to that end? That's such a, a great question. question. Yeah, <laughs> such a good question. You know, this is actually something that, uh, so the first show we had a transit in, in Esther, the curator in, in Budapest, Esther, the curator approached us and she was fascinated. Like this is what actually interested her about us. Uh, the idea that when she asked us, but what are you guys? And we said, oh, that depends on who is asking. <laughs> um, and so the, this idea of, of definitely, um, appropriating different masks or different hats of like the artist or the curator, the, the architect, uh, appropriating different perhaps realities also as a, as a way to survive or to, to produce a certain practice. Um, so of course uh, it's definitely, this is something that happens yes in foundation where we were tricking the cameraman and reproducing entire scenes without him knowing. And at some point like, the poor thing got really freaked out. I mean, I guess like <laughs> with, with certain situations that were just happening that were extremely bizarre because in our world, they were kind of controlled and we knew how they were going to develop. Um, and yeah, definitely this is in a way a metaphor of <laughs> yes. what happened. Yeah. But I think the same way when we look at the territory or we look at the city and we accept that it can, you can never just freeze that moment and it is always evolving and it's not fixed. So the same way um, is also our practice operating or our own identity is forming. We don't see them as a, as a necessarily fixed entities. Thinking about this format of residency and uh, Eduardo and I met in a, in a residency format and also <laughs> your, um, 
interest in extraction and how the residency format uh, plays sometimes with the, the precariousness and vulnerability of artists or, or cultural practitioners or even architectural uh, yeah, practitioners and how that format can in itself be quite extractive. Um, and yeah, I, I think Eduardo remembers the experience that we had in that specific residency. And of course, in your, in your projects, you take it to the next level. You, you, you kind of push it even further in foundation, like, uh, and also TDCU. Um, how, what's it, how, do you, how do you make sure that people are taken care of? And then, you know, yeah. there's a point. Yeah. But also when, uh, I, I think that uh, it's a very, very interesting question because especially now, since our lives has changed a lot uh, with, uh, with the pandemic, you also really see a flip how certain vulnerability was a strength at some point and how right now there that probably these things doesn't operate the same way. So when you are operating in these fields of precarity, there is also a certain strength into this uh, sort of uh, lifestyles. But I think um like in terms of that question, uh, I think the idea of like what is good praxis, particularly in the realm of residences, which can be such extractive and abusive mechanisms. Um, when we were organizing our residencies, we were always uh, paying residents, um, like um, of course covering all their expenses. Um, transport, accommodation, per the end, mm -hmm. and um, in the case of foundation, also a wage as kind of part of the art that was being generated. Uh, but still, you know, I think there is very, also working with the Deep Growth Institute, right, going mm -hmm. to certain communities that are extremely vulnerable, talking uh, about ideas, and, and how do we uh, uh, prevent that process from being extracted. And this was something that we were constantly reflecting on. And uh, part of the degrowth manual or the beauty of the degrowth manual is that with every iteration, every workshop, there is a new edition. So we only print the, the amount, amount of copies for participants that we have. Um, and at the end, there is always uh, a feedback uh, that comes into the, the publication itself to make this workshop, I mean, the idea is that this workshop is, uh, we're not even present in this workshop, that this workshop kind of takes place on its own, it's not hierarchical, uh, but how can we prevent this, the same ex extractivist mechanisms? Because for the same reason, uh, for us, still is very difficult to think about, for example, degrowth master planning. And this is just because we are raised in a society that is extractivist, that is pro-growth, uh, that is also patriarchal and homophobic and racist and of course but i think deconstructing all of these thoughts in this urban area that is not necessarily as um, developed in terms of this car uh, the discursive uh, element is not as developed as in other elements of society um was also yeah it's definitely challenging and difficult and we catch ourselves sometimes falling track mm -hmm. of those yeah and then going back to what you said i uh, so in your practice, you try to come up with these um, emancipatory, emancipatory uh, spatial practices to think of new urban futures. And uh, you can talk, we can talk about the Degrowth Institute Foundation. You also kind of speculate in a, in a future city or a new city or a new community. Then there's this, this project Swarm that um, you didn't present here, but I thought it was really interesting because you kind of create a, a software that would have the capacity to replace a master planning office. And I was going through the documentation of your projects and some of the things that you wrote. And indeed, you, you are fully aware that uh, in many uh, urban development processes around the world, there is this inclusion already of artistic and socially uh, driven uh, practices within more technocratic methodologies, let's say, or within more usual methodologies uh, that focus more on, uh, yeah, social participation, you know, all of that, artistic uh, emancipatory practices, etc. But what I wanted to know, uh, and you said that you still don't know exactly how to, to implement a degrowth urbanism, but to what extent do you think um, it is possible or even desirable that 
um, your methodologies, and I don't know if we can call them queer methodologies or queer approaches to uh, urban planning, for example, would find space within the mainstream processes of urban development or urban planning. Do you think that translation is possible or even something desirable? Yeah, exactly. I think I think that was from a very early point our position that we did not want to find necessarily solutions. Now, of course, the idea of navigating that is also is also difficult and contested because we would go to several of these communities and these cities and always work with local organizations, local stakeholders. And of course, these people want solutions. Like, why, why are you involving me in your workshops? Like, even if there is money, like, why, why am I? Um, and I think the idea of, of creating um, a new form of, of discourse or, or approach, I think what we wanted to do with the degrowth workshops, for example, was more, rather than propose a solution, to acknowledge that there are other paths or other ways without necessarily taking um, or showing steps towards those. Uh, because I totally agree with, with what I think the question is hinting at, that these um, methodologies are not designed to be incorporated in the current systems uh, that are in place. And I don't think, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think it would, yeah. It's, I think it's almost dangerous to use the same language that we use to plan for growth to think about uh, degrowth. So it kind of really requires uh, a different vocabulary I think what's very interesting uh, that we witnessed uh, in the degrowth workshops is that, uh, as Adorno said, there is uh, expectation that things are going to get fixed because these are a very um, vulnerable uh, towns often. And it's interesting to see how there is a transformation because we also... Um, there is a certain process involved where you look at the map and then you think about the memory and then you think about the future. Um, and so usually in the day one, uh, we're still in the problem solving mode, but then in the day two, there is often a switch. And I think what's very important uh, in this case, uh, the feedback that we have received, it is the ability to maybe look, in, look differently at the city. And for this particular context, it's very important because there is a huge shift in their identity. Mm -hmm. So just like, and there is often this kind of templates of how do you fix, uh, let's say a shrinking city, what, what kind of um, urban infrastructures you would bring to do that. So I think it's great to see that, uh, you know, that shift, even towards, okay, maybe let's redefine the different identity uh, could be, um, is very interesting. I would like to mention just one more example about Eisenhuttenstadt uh, in Germany, which is an example where they actually implemented uh, a degrowth, it's implementing the degrowth, uh, but with the tools of the master planning. So that you know, if we think about the building, then that was demolishing. So it was a strategic demolishing. And it's super interesting to talk with the planner of this town uh, where she's an architect. Her father uh, was part of, uh, he was planner in this uh, town and uh, she had to unbuild it. And it was uh, quite early on. So it was quite a long time ago. So she really went through this process of confronting community of demolishing and how that created, uh, she realized she needs a facilitation that people were crying, people didn't understand what she talks about, they didn't trust the government. So, and it is interesting to think what would have happened with this city because it's very quaint right now, uh, if we actually would see these ruins because um, they really demolished a huge proportion of the city. So yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question to think about the other types of tools or even like a language, how we can describe that. And I think for me, it's also a question of uh, duration and, and temporality and like su sustenance of certain processes, right? Because of course, certain residencies or grants or budgets can be leveraged to create or to instigate 
these processes, right? Or the, the stinking and discursive processes. But then when the event finishes, when the, um, the budget ends, when, you know, especially with the temporality of uh, art events, it's quite different from the temporality of uh, uh, building projects. And of course I'm generalizing and it, it's not true for every case, there's exceptions, but basically what I'm interested in, in <laughs> understanding is how also you design the afterlife of, of the projects. How can you, or can you, do you, do you need to kind of maintain or assure that there's a sustainability for the processes or the communities that you put in place? Or on the other hand, um, you, you, you also think that by not doing it, it's part of the process or part of the operation of the work. Yeah, I think that here it's very important uh, for us to understand uh, that um, I think this really goes in the line of like validating your work in front of often like uh, funding bodies or collaborators where you need to prove the um, importance of it uh, through a kind of continuity. And I think that often you see this, uh, there is a certain uh, way how this work leaves a legacy, but it's often really not that traceable or it becomes traceable after uh, a while. So when there is opportunity, it's great to plan for it. But I think also the way, at least the way our work is uh, designed, it's very much about a shifting certain perspective and then in that moment perhaps the a kind of like the legacy of that can manifest maybe in five years mm -hmm. when the opportunity arises but i think it's again like a really amazing issue to discuss that um, yeah how do you approach that uh, and and indeed sometimes it's cut very abruptly and it again becomes extremely extractive process in the community um, with these sort of uh, events. I think especially because the idea of this idea of, of legacy, right, tends to also be in, um, engaged or very much embedded in a, in a growth discourse, something that expands or, or extends in time that is durable and sustainable is considered good. And of course, I, I know that perhaps by saying, oh, it doesn't matter if things exist or not. This is also a very problematic position. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm trying to say is that perhaps also one thing that we've come to realize is uh, particularly in residency contexts, the best outcomes are often intangible and are often impossible to measure and to include in, in grant reports. Uh, and this, these things can be, of course, social connections, but also uh, sometimes just being exposed to a specific landscape or, or engage yourself romantically with, with someone, or uh, I, th I think they are beyond the residency space. I think there are so many other aspects that, that come into play um, that, that it's funny that we often focus so much on the, on the exhibition or the events that and whether or not that has an afterlife. Whereas for example, maybe we don't care or we don't maybe ask the questions on, on whether that community of people that has been formed for one month, three months um, continues over time or, uh, or or what happens when you brought these people together or- Or when the artwork becomes a ruin in itself, right? When you bring something and it is left, um, yeah. yeah. So I'm curious to, to know about um, also the translation between your methodologies uh, from you know these arts uh, context or art and architecture uh, exhibition spaces or residencies to the university and academic settings. So how for you guys is that translation? And I asked um, last session something. Uh, to Mona Mahal and Asli Sedbest, and which proved to be a hot topic for them, so maybe it's also a hot topic for you, uh, is how these symbiotic pedagogies that you're creating can survive the privatization of universities and, and also the marketization of education and, and knowledge. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I think uh, 
precisely for this very particular topic, since arriving in Bangkok, uh, I am part of an initiative that is called Monitor Lizard House. It is uh, an alternative pedagogy, spatial pedagogy space in Bangkok, where we're pretty much trying to, to do that, to deconstruct or, or, or rather build other forms of knowledge exchange, particularly in the fields of architecture or spatial theory. Um, because perhaps we do see the limitations that are happening within academia. Now, our we were teaching before at different universities or different centers throughout the whole time we were Meta C2, but I think in Bangkok, uh, this process has crystallized um, in a different way. And um, it's also interesting because we arrived here just before the pandemic hit. So I think also with online classrooms, there has been a lot of new opportunities that have opened in terms of like, how do you adapt this course? Um, I think as an example, we're both running studios in our university. And I think, of course, a lot of the topics that we were researching, the idea of ruins, demolitions, uh, but also new materials, new forms of bonding are things that we are definitely feeding into um, through the form of briefs or um, projects for studio. Last term, my students were looking uh, at demolitions, but definitely, I think there is definitely um, a hierarchy in here that doesn't exist, for example, in the workshops. There are grading sheets, there is attendance, uh, there are targets and goals. Um, so in a way, on a more personal level, there yeah. is not the conflict because you can really um, ex have that exchange with the students, but then perhaps other more systemic issues, uh, they don't necessarily stand in the way of this exchange of knowledge. But yes, I think they bring uh, this conversation where, whereas when we work as Metacito, we can sort of control the scope of our actions. We can imagine, we see like, you know, we can evaluate, like, is that beneficial for our community? Uh, are we doing it right? Is it extractive? Um, how is the process managed? We have full control on that. Whereas when you are in a, this more institutional um, environment, you don't have a control of the whole process. So of course that uh, can be problematic. And I was really curious about Monitor Lizard and uh, you gave us a little bit of a glimpse Eduardo there, so thank you. But I was also wondering, so you've curated quite a range of things from letters to the mayor, Athens, which is a very specific format and that I also refer to in my presentation because I curated the one in Sao Paulo, uh, to your artist residencies, to you know, yeah, being artistic directors of um, urban, Film and Urbanism Festival. So I wanted to, yeah, know a little bit more how you how you see this, this the curatorial as being also uh, a medium that allows for for things that um, artistic practice and architecture do, don't. So how can that be a plug in in you know the operations that you do, but also the the format of the exhibition. Um, what are the potentialities that you see there, and also the limitations acknowledging this big range, no? Because letters to the mayor has nothing to do with TDCU. You still did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think maybe we can begin with the exhibition part. I think uh, when we were organizing exhibitions, I think there is an aspect that always fascinated Levan and myself, which was the idea of uh, DIY and low cost. So I feel that uh, often, uh, exhibitions with like very small budgets. I mean, I guess was a type of challenge that kind of excited us. Um, yeah, in terms of like, how can you produce something with a very, very lim limited amount of money, which is how with another project, we started making these um, tapestries of uh, with A4 paper printed and, and taped. Um, which turned out to be like very like laborious in terms of labor, but like very cheap to produce or very cheap to travel or to reproduce because we could just reprint it elsewhere. Um, and I think 
this, so I, I think all our exhibitions have always had also that immersive aspect. Like we, so we, we do have a fetish for like, yeah, these constraints in exhibition, uh, but also perhaps uh, the idea of, of immersing oneself in, in a space. And yes, maybe this the is the architect. architect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in terms of the curatorial, I mean, I think, I think these divisions that exist today in terms of like the artist, the curator, the architect, I think in a way um, we're living in a very kind of mixed reality. Like uh, when, I mean, in a way, an architect could be also a curator of materials at a construction site or often artists now with the whole fabrication epoch we're living in where fabricators produce work. In a way, there is also a, a, a strong element of, of curating a certain discourse or a certain idea within something that maybe um, where the, the distance in the craft, the, the, that gap has widened. Mm -hmm. This is not universal for our artists or whatever, but what I'm trying to say is that I think we are uh, living at, in a time of, of more ambiguity. And I, I think this is also why for us, it didn't matter if people saw us as curator. I mean, it mattered if, if there was money involved or if there were opportunities involved, of course, but ourselves, we didn't kind of, uh, we were not too fuzzy about whether uh, we were artists or curators or artistic directors. I think good ideas or exciting ideas manifest and then people produce them. I think it's also the, the fact that uh, we have more of like the ideas that we want to realize and uh, in a way, any mean is good to realize them. It can be a video, it can be making an exhibition if it's about multiplying those uh, voices or um, it's making a, a space. Um, and also like for us, it is very important uh, how we can communicate uh, the ideas uh, or exchange ideas uh, with others. And again, there is so many different exciting ways to try and do that. You can do it through publication that we also like to do, uh, or again, the video narratives or a gallery space. So I think, yeah, perhaps when you're driven by these kind of um, um, goals or, uh, or um, uh, wishes or desires, then also like the discipline doesn't, and. I guess also the, we have the mindset of migrating from the discipline. I think that also probably contributes to the ease of moving uh, across the boundaries of, of the artist or the architect, uh, because it's something that perhaps we're very comfortable also with in terms. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to what Eduardo was saying. Um... I'll, I'll tell you what I am depending on who's asking, no? It's also how you <laughs> those labels to, to, to get things done in a way. Um, I'm very aware of time and especially in Bangkok because it's quite late and we know that Zoom fatigue is real. So uh, I wanted to end on a high note and it has been amazing to talk to you and very pleasurable. I hope we see each other in person very soon. Thank you so much, Eduardo and Liza, for sharing the, the wonderful work. And uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what's coming next. Thank you so much for having us. It was really amazing. The time flew by. We don't notice that it's really late. Uh, it was really, uh, really great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Bruno. It was really, really amazing. And, and thank you so much, Joanna, for, for hosting. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much uh, for the beautiful content you shared today. I was uh, least, least, uh, listening with uh, very hungrily, let's say, uh, for what you were saying, and of course, sharing your love for uh, the hybrid field that uh, <laughs> surrounds architecture. Uh, and uh, I wanted to thank Bruno for, uh, of course, moderating and curating all four episodes of WIP uh, Work in Progress, uh, the series of this year. Um, and also the participants uh, from the last sessions, O Grupo Inteiro, uh, Asli Servas and Mana Mahal. Um, and uh, probably next year there will be more uh, WIP uh, work in progress uh, from episode 12 uh, and on. Uh, so thank you 
and uh, hopefully see you soon. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you